since I was in denial, I was in college, I was playing sports, et cetera, et cetera. So things progressed. It's the typical story that you've probably heard a thousand times. Um, I started buying a lot of pills. Pills were very expensive back then. Pills were hard to find back then. I graduated, if you will, from Percocets to Oxycontin. Oxycontins, were, when I was buying them, were $50 per pill. And I was doing five of them a day. Playing baseball at UT, not having any kind of income, I had to break the law to feed my addiction. And when, when uh, Andrea was talking about, you know, sometimes taking those prescription painkillers can actually be worse for an injury. That's absolutely what happened to me. My shoulder didn't heal right. I was going to have to have surgery again. I wasn't going to school. I wasn't going to class. I wasn't going to physical therapy for my shoulder. I wasn't getting the grades. I wasn't, I wasn't even playing anymore. So I decided to drop off the team and drop out of school. I think I got a job at Jimmy John's or something like that. And I just continued to, to break the law to feed my addiction. I remember one day, I went to my dealer early in the morning, first thing. I would just go to his house. I wouldn't even call him. And I walked in and he said, man, I don't have anything, buddy. I'm sorry. I'm not getting my prescription filled for two days. I said, okay, well, I got to go make subs at Jimmy John's, dude. You got to do something. I got to figure something out, man. Please. I can't feel like this. He said, let me make a phone call. Made a phone call. Came back in the room. He said, Matt, I, I got something for you, man. It's going to make you feel better. It's cheaper. It's stronger. It lasts longer. But you got to shoot it up. It's called heroin. I'll give you the first one for free, actually, because I know you're going to come back. I said, okay. At that point, I didn't even care what it was called. I just wanted to feel better. To give you guys I'm trying to think how I can explain this with the withdrawal symptoms. Anybody ever has anybody not had the flu in here? Has everybody had the flu? Okay, so like if you take the flu, guys, and literally multiply it times one thousand, the worst flu you've ever had and multiply it times a thousand. That's kind of kind of what withdrawal symptoms feel like. But on top of that, there's a mental obsession that's driving you crazy because you know what's going to make you feel better. You want to stop, but you know you can just go get one more for real cheap and take all that pain away real quick. You have no appetite. When I, when I finally got clean this time, I was, I was <coughs> going through those withdrawals for almost three weeks. I didn't sleep for three weeks. I didn't have any appetite. I was throwing up. Diarrhea, shaking, insomnia, skin crawling, hot and cold. And that sounds bad, but the worst part's up here. I can't even explain it. Is there anybody in here that has never tasted chocolate before? Has everybody tasted chocolate? Who loves chocolate the most? Andrea. I've never tasted chocolate. Can you explain to me so that I understand what chocolate tastes like? It's real hard to explain, but what I can tell you is the feeling. Like when you get dark chocolate, like really good dark chocolate, and it's on your tongue and it kind of smells and pulls it all together, you just smile. It's a good tasting chocolate. <laughs> it melts. It melts, and it pulls it all together, and it, and it tastes real good. <laughs> right. Caramel, is that what you're explaining? No, that's good dark chocolate. You guys see my point? Oh. You guys see no, but do you see my point? You'll never understand what chocolate tastes like until you taste it. There's no way to really describe what chocolate tastes like. I can't, if you've never had chocolate, I can't, I can say it's sweet, but so is a blow pop. I can say it melts in your mouth, but so does caramel. You know, I can say it, 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 it makes you feel good, but so does looking at a picture of a baby smiling. You know what I mean? There's, you can't describe what it's like until you go through it. Those withdrawal symptoms, guys, I can't describe it, but it's the worst. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I mean that wholeheartedly, too. It's the worst feeling. And that's what, that's what stopped me from getting sober for a long time. I didn't want to feel like that because I knew it lasted for so long. 
So I got addicted to, to heroin real quick. It was bad. Um, it was so bad. I shot heroin for nine years. Um, as soon as I started shooting heroin, I, I stopped drinking, I stopped smoking. Um, I never did anything else. Heroin became the top of my priority list, I guess, if you will. Um, I didn't care about eating. I didn't care about showering. I didn't care about obeying the law. I didn't care about my family. I didn't care about anything that normal people care about. All that stuff became second, third, and fourth, and fifth, and sixth on my party list. I would do anything, anything to feed my addiction. To, to kind of summarize it real quick, in those nine years that I was addicted, and I got sober here and there. If you, I, I used to call it sober back then. It's not really sobriety. I was, I was drinking. For me, at least. That's my story. I don't call that sobriety. I put down heroin, but I was still drinking and smoking. You know, because I didn't think you could have fun without doing something. Um, it never lasted long, because as soon as I started drinking or smoking weed again, it took me straight back to heroin. Um, in those nine years, I was arrested 13 times in four different states. I'm a convicted felon um, for a home invasion and for grand theft. I've overdosed and died. I was dead for five days in the ICU, being kept alive by a ventilator. Um, I lost everybody that was close to me. I pushed them all away. Nobody, I think you guys can kind of just tell, like, I love life. I love my friends. Like, I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky person. I like being around people. And, like, today, people generally like being around me because because I, I, I try to be who I am, and I like to help people. When I was in my addiction, everybody, everybody in my life, all my friends, family, mom, everybody who knew the old Matt wanted nothing to do with me. It got to the point where I was homeless walking the streets of East Toledo, which is leading the city of Toledo in overdoses. It's bad over there. I was walking the streets of East Toledo homeless with nothing but the clothes on my back. And I would call my mom from time to time, and I would ask her, Mom, can I please just come over and get a sandwich? I haven't eaten in two weeks. Like, you can put it out on the porch. I don't even need to come in. You know what she would say to me? She'd say, Matt, if you step on my property, I'm calling the police. Click. That's it. There was no, there was no more conversation. There was times it was snowing. Mom, can I please just... I'm walking around and it's snowing and I have a t-shirt and jeans on. Can I please come sleep in the garage? I won't even step foot in the house. Same thing. You come on my property, I'm calling the police. I remember one day, um, she was at work. So I snuck, over, I snuck over to her garage and I just couldn't do it anymore. Like I was just so fed up and miserable, I was hopeless. I thought, I, I, was, I was fully convinced and I believed that I was either going to die or go to prison. Like, I didn't even care anymore about the crimes that I was committing. I was just, I, I, just, I, I almost wanted to get caught because I was so sick and miserable of what I was doing. I remember I snuck into her garage, I broke into her garage, and I sat there, and I sat there with a pistol from somebody's house that I was using at, and I put that pistol in my mouth. And I, I just wanted to die. I didn't think I could get clean. And um, I cried. And the only reason that I didn't pull the trigger is because I didn't want her to find me like that in her garage. That's the only reason. It's not because I wanted to live. The only reason I didn't pull the trigger is because I didn't want her to find me like that. And uh, when I had overdosed previously, there is a program that you guys may have heard of called the DART program that's going on in Lucas County right now. And I'd been introduced to that program when I overdosed. They came up and they talked to me and they offered help and they told me uh, they have some resources and you know, if I'm ready right now, they can help. If I'm not, here's a card, please call because you're gonna die. 
And by the way, that's the one statistic, with, those are some amazing statistics. The one statistic that Andrew didn't mention that I, that I want to mention, eight people, there's eight people in Ohio today that are going to die from an opiate-related drug overdose. Eight people. Those are, those are people. Those are people like me, like Tommy, like Katie. Those are people, good people, that have just gotten sucked into a horrible, evil life. Probably from a prescription painkiller prescription. Eight people, guys. Those are people, they have loved ones. They've got family. They're going to die today. Eight people every day in Ohio are dying from, from prescription opioid overdoses or heroin overdoses. So back to what was going on. I, I, uh, I remembered that card. And I called the DART program. And I told them what was going on. And I told my mom what was going on. I called her. And... You know, she budged. She budged that night, and she said, you can stay here tonight. I'm taking you to treatment. We're going we're gonna to link up with Dr. in the morning. And I went to detox at the Zeph Center, which I will always have a soft spot in my heart for. I love Zeph and everything that they do. I got sober at Zeph. And when I was in there, day one, day two, and day three of detox, I met five other people, and we were miserable. We were going through those withdrawal symptoms that I was talking about. We had seen each other in meetings and stuff before. We didn't really know each other that well. We had seen each other. Obviously, we knew we had all relapsed because we were in detox again. And we had just lost a couple close friends um, from overdoses. And we decided that we were going to form something. I don't even think we really knew what it was going to be. It was a joke at first. It was literally a joke. Like we, we said, let's have this team that holds each other accountable. When you're feeling crappy and you don't want to get up and go to group, I'm going to make you get up and you're going to go and you're going to ask questions and learn something. And when you're feeling crappy, I'm going to do the same for you. Until we can get up on our feet, hold each other accountable, love each other, and stop dying and torturing our families and breaking laws and ruining our lives. That's what it was at first. That's all it was. It's a team. What are we going to call it? Well, it's about recovery. Let's call it team recovery. So we would literally, guys, like, <laughs> this sounds so, so corny, but we would put our hands, like, in a circle like a team, and we'd be like, one, two, three, team recovery! <laughs> oh, good times. <laughs> this sounds so corny, but, like, that's, I swear that's how it started. And when we got out of detox, things, like, progressed. We had a Facebook page. That's like the first thing that we did. We had like three followers or something. We were awesome. And we held signs down, downtown Toledo that said, heroin kills, free hugs, recovery is possible. Positive signs, you know, to, to try to, because everybody pictures a drug addict holding a sign asking for money, you know, panhandling, asking for change. So we decided we were going to show drug addicts in a different light. And the signs that we held were positive. And we posted on Facebook. I woke up the next day and there was like half a million views and 200,000 likes and all kinds of messages and we were like, holy, we got to do something about this. So we, we officialized it. We, we developed a phone number and we, we developed kind of like a code of ethics and we got a website and we started getting people into treatment and we, we, we formalized it or officialized it through the Ohio Secretary of State and we submitted an application for a 501c3 nonprofit organization through the IRS. And things have just changed so much. And I'll tell you guys, we're not compensated for the stuff that we do. We stole from society for so long and damaged people's lives, innocent people, that this is how we give back, just a little bit. We realize we'll probably never fully repay the things that we did, but if we can help one person not go through what we went through or get out of the life that we live, then it's all worth it. Team recovery has kind of turned into like a three-phase attack towards this disease. Obviously treatment. We get people in wherever you can get in. We're not affiliated with any facilities. We're going to get you in where you can get in. Because this is life or death. 
and, if, and if one facility has a waiting list, we're going to try to get you in somewhere else. You know, and we've seen people die on a waiting list. So treatment is huge for us, and we, tr we try to partner, if you will, with, with facilities not just in Lucas County or Wood County or Ohio, but all over the country. Prevention is huge. We believe that if you can present some information to a student and, and stop them from making the same decisions that we made and getting addicted and ruining their lives, we won't have to worry about the lack of resources. So we spoke at 35 schools last year, from fifth grade to university level, and, and I love doing that. I love speaking to the schools. Um, we also are, are our third phase of teen recovery is family support. So we have two family support groups that we call FAD, and the acronym stands for Families After Addiction or Death. The reason that it started is because we got a message from a wife back in like January, I think it was, and she said that her husband had just died of a fentanyl overdose. Where can I go to get some help? And I suggested some programs that are already existing. She said, I can't go there. They won't let me talk about fentanyl and heroin. I have to talk about certain things. Um, I didn't feel comfortable in this one. I said, OK, we're going to start one for you. Two weeks later, we had our first FAD meeting. I expected her and a couple other people to come. There was 50 people, 50 family members that have been affected by this disease came to our first meeting. And we have it every Tuesday. Every Tuesday there was 10 more people. And we outgrew that facility and now we're at Prometica Toledo Hospital on Tuesday nights. And then the, the FAD members wanted more meetings, so we developed one on Thursday nights. What is life like today in that? Uh, it's so much better. I just, I can't even really describe it. It's night and day. Um, I used to run from the police. I work with them today. Like I can literally walk into to the, to the DART program headquarters and take them some donuts. They won't let me in without donuts. <laughs> Just kidding. It's amazing, by the way, like what the DART program is doing. Law enforcement is actually helping drug addicts who are breaking the law get into treatment, and it's working. When I, when I got into recovery, I had four warrants. I was facing three years in prison for a probation violation. I had no car, no job, no family members, no friends. I had lost custody of my son. My girlfriend at the time left me. I didn't want to live. And today, every single thing that I just named is completely reversed. I've gotten my life back. I have a car today. I have a job. I've developed, with the help of some other people, a nonprofit that's helping people every day. I have a bank account. That sounds like, so what? You know, but I have a bank account. Speaking of my bank account, my, my wallet is sitting right there with two drug addicts. I trust them. I have friends. I have friends today. Friends in recovery. <laughs> but they trust me too. The team recovery bank account is sitting right there. My bank account was sitting right there. I could give my wallet to them overnight, and I would trust that my friends today wouldn't steal from me. When I was in addiction, I didn't trust anybody. No, there was certainly nobody that trusted me. Like, that doesn't happen. I have real friends today. I have my family back. I have my son back. I have a job, a very good job. I'm happy. Like, I love my life. I can't even believe, like, when I think about the, the fact that I was even that I would even contemplate wanting to end my life. It just, it, it goes to show how hopeless and scary this disease is. Because I love life so much and it took me to that point. I'm so glad that I didn't do it. I'm so glad that I didn't do it. Um, I wanna say too, and, and again, this is my personal story, 
that I've tried Suboxone in the past. I've tried Methadone in the past. And for me personally, and I'm not talking about anybody else, but for me personally, those things didn't work for me. And, and when I took Suboxone and I took Methadone, I still got high off of them. You know, it was, for, for me, it was replacing one drug for another. Yes, I wasn't sticking a needle in my arm every day, but it was still an opioid-based medicine that was getting me high. And so this time, I, 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 can't, I can't do those. I don't have the luxury. That's just the way my brain is wired. I can't put any mood or mind-altering substance in my body for the rest of my life, and I'm okay with that. I just had knee surgery. I blew my knee out playing basketball because Kobe retired, and I thought they were going to replace me, him with me. <laughs> playing basketball against her, actually. <sighs> and I blew my knee out. I tore my ACL, MCL, meniscus, and cartilage. I literally had reconstructive knee surgery. And I told the doctors, I don't want anything. Now, that sounds crazy because it's such a, 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 like a, a, a serious surgery. They had alternatives for me. They had alternatives. They put like a, a pump in my leg where it fed a a numbing medication that was non-narcotic to my femoral nerve, I believe it was, and I couldn't feel the pain. Now granted, when I woke up from the surgery, I had to have something. They gave me medication while I was monitored in the hospital. But when I left, I told them, I don't want a script. Please don't even give it to me. You know, and the doctor was actually very, very, and it's interesting how, you know, 10 years ago when I had my surgery, a minor arthroscopic surgery for a rotator cuff, Here's a prescription for 90 pills. But today when I ask them to not do anything, they have alternatives. And I, and I think that's good, that it's getting better. I also remember another time I went to, and I'm going to end real, real quick, because I know I'm probably going over, but Andrea went over too, so it's her fault. I remember uh, when I was like three months sober, I went to the dentist, and I got some teeth yanked out. And he, he offered some stuff to me, and I was like, no, man, I'm in recovery. I just can't do it. Like, I, I don't want it. I don't need it. And I appreciate it, but thank you. And he's like, wow. That's, you're the first person that's ever said that to me. He's like, how do you do it? I was like, well, if you really want the story, we're going to be here for a couple of a couple hours. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because he said, my son's a heroin addict. And I can't imagine him. He's still out there. I can't imagine him turning down a script like that. Like, I give you so much credit. Please keep doing what you're doing. As a matter of fact, this, this dentist visit is on me. Didn't even make me pay for it. You know, so it, it is getting better, I think, with the prescriptions and the doctors. But there's no doubt that I think the statistics say 80 to 90% of heroin addicts start with opiate pain pills in the terms of opiates. I mean, people don't just generally, generally people don't just wake up, like, you know, drinking, smoking weed, whatever it is, doing nothing. Wake up one day and be like, oh my god, I'm going to go grab a needle and some heroin and, and get addicted to this. Like, it doesn't really happen. I mean, I'm sure it may have happened before, but it, it, it's not very common. 80 to 90 percent of heroin addicts start with pain pills, so yes, it is a problem. I'll, uh, I'll stop talking just so that we can get to some Q&A, but I want to thank you guys for listening. Thank you for, for having team recovery here. And um, I won't shoot any heroin today. I hope nobody else does either. Thank you.